Praise the Lord. That's why we trust in Him. Amen? God morning, family of choice. So good to have everyone here this morning. So glad you all chose to come this morning and uh, uh, brave this terrible weather that we got going on, right? And so uh, I'm loving it, right? I mean, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if I'm in the fall of my season necessarily, but I sure got white, right? And so um, she's turning colors out there. I love the oranges, the reds, the yellows, the everything, right? The brown, it's okay right now. Who come the end of winter will be tired of the white, I'm sure. But, you know, um, what a beautiful day it is. I love it. I love it. And, and I, I pray that as, as, as fall falls on our, our, on our world, on our our country, because um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but winter is different around the world in different places. So, but as fall falls here, I pray that that we'll allow the leaves and the and the cover and the shrubbery to fall in our hearts as well, so that we can have new birth once again, also, and have a spring in our life as well. And so. Um, so just, uh, man, what a beautiful, beautiful day. I encourage you to turn to Jude. I'm going to be there in just a minute. Um, and and I, it's Jude's, I, I call it Jude's letter because it's really not a book. Um, if we know Jude, it's not a book. Now, I'll help you out with that so you can find it just in case you're not used to where it's at. Um, because it's only 25 verses, it's kind of thin to find in your Bible. It's If you go all the way to Revelations 1, Revelation 1, and then turn back one page, you're there, okay? So um, it's right before Revelation 1, and, and uh, uh, Jude, is, is, is a, um, Jude is calling the church to wake up. He's telling them it's time to wake up. We need to wake up. And, uh, um, and so that's the name of this series as we walk for four weeks. We're going to walk through Jude. Um, it's 25 verses, and you're like, man, we're going to have to really talk about it to get, 25, get four weeks out of 25 verses. Um, good. Okay, so uh, we're okay with that. Um, so our series, uh, uh, to this, this Time to Wake Up series, is we're going to kick it off with Get Up and Go. First thing Jude does, he talks about, in the first four verses, he talks about it's time for the church to get up and go. Get up and go do what you were called to do. Get up and get at them. Let's get active. Let's wake back up. And so um, did you know that when it comes to defending our faith, because that's the struggle that the church was having was the defending the faith. And, and Jude is, a, is a, a letter that's not written. It's called a general epistle. It's not written to a church, like Romans is written to the church of Rome. It's not written to a church, but the church, okay? Um, so um, did you know when Jude, he, he writes this letter and he says, hey, look, it's time for us to, to contend for our faith, to defend our faith, it's time to get up and go, right? And and did you know that the best way for us to defend our faith is to know what we believe and live like we believe it? The way to defend our faith is to know what we believe and live like we believe it. And if you get nothing else today, I want you to get that the way to defend our faith is to know what we believe and live like we believe it. That's the most important thing you're going to get out of this message today. Jude, I'm going to give you a little background on it. Um, these are messing me up. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jude, uh, starts out, Jude is, is, is Jesus's physical brother, his half brother. He's the brother of James, who is the author of the book of James. Okay. So Jesus has a couple brothers that have their books, letters. Um, and, uh, uh, he's the, he's, so he's the son of Mary and Joseph. Um, he is, um, uh, Jude's letter, as I say, is written to the church, not a church, um, he's considered to be somewhat controversial because Jude references some writings that are not part of our, what we call the canonized, we call, what we call the Bible. Okay, he references letters from outside of that. However, it doesn't mean they weren't faith-filled. There's a lot of letters that were not included here for God's reasons. Um, and, and the reality is, is that that doesn't mean that they're, they're heresy. It doesn't mean that they're wrong, right? But they were very relevant in that day. And so Jude's connecting the people he's reaching out to, to the writings about Jesus of that day. And so it's considered to be somewhat controversial. And, and some people don't think it should be in scripture because it doesn't only reference other scripture. Um, so, um, it's very short, like I say, 25, 25 verses, um, but 
boy, there's some punch in these verses, okay? And so we're going to start looking at, start out looking at Jude by asking you, I want to ask you a couple questions, a show of hands, okay? Um, how many of you, uh, um, these questions are going to be just about sleep, okay? So um, uh, how many of you feel like you need more sleep, right? Uh, th- most people in our world today, it's like, I just can't get enough sleep. Um, how many of you um, have ever fallen asleep in front of the TV or uh, watching football or a movie or whatever, right? Um, so why, but watching TV, falling asleep, right? Okay, so, so how many of you um, have, uh, have fallen asleep in church? Remember, I can see your eyes, okay? And so honesty is good. And so, um, and a couple of you lying, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, um, I actually, I have my glasses off right now. I can't see your eyes very good, so it's okay. Um, but anyway, um, how, about, how about this one? Have ever fallen asleep while driving? Sadly, unfortunately, I have done it, and I used to have a really, really bad habit of it, as a matter of fact. Have you ever driven, you know, like maybe got on I-29 and uh, at like maybe the renter exit, and you remember like 12th Street exit, and then you didn't remember anything until you were on Highway 18, a couple miles outside of Davis. Any you ever done that? Unfortunately, I've done literally done that, and I used to do it regularly when I worked in Sioux Falls. Um, now you might be like, "Well, why is this? Why are we? Why are we even talking about this?" Because the church had fallen asleep. And I would contend that the church today has fallen asleep. At the very least, become very lethargic. Because sometimes, even like when I drove the car, it wasn't that I was sleeping, right? I had to have been awake enough to maneuver the vehicle. I wasn't awake enough to know what I was doing. Right? I don't didn't know my surroundings. And the church today has become very lethargic, very complacent, and that's the church that Jude is preaching to, is, is writing this letter to, is a church, the, the church in that day also had, see, we're not the only ones, right? Um, the church had also gone to sleep, really. And so that's why Jude writes this letter, which, which is telling, told them they needed a wake-up call, was calling them out, and today we need a wake-up call. Today we need a wake-up call. And that's what Jude's doing. So anyway, um, unfortunately, when Jude writes this letter, there's some who had come into the body who um, were unfaithful. They were unfaithful to God. They were unfaithful to the church. And so he's calling people out about on that. And he says, here's the deal, right? Um, um, we need to get up and go. We need to, we need to, the church needs to get up and go and get up and go and do what it is we're called to do. And so um, the get up and go that we need to do is to defend or contend for the church. De- con- defend and contend for our faith. And again, the best way to do, defend our faith is to know what we believe and live like we believe it. And you might have noticed I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that a bunch more times today because I want you to take that to heart. That's the Man, we have to know what we believe. If we don't know what we believe, we'll believe anything. And we have to live out what we believe, what we claim to believe. We have to live it out. And here's the thing. We will live out whatever it is we believe. just depends if we're calling ourselves a Christian and living like the devil. So Jude's calling him out. Jude 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept in Jesus Christ. Jude, I shared with you a second ago, he's a half-brother of Jesus. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jude says, even though your family, guess what? We're to serve Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling us to. That's what Christ calls us to. He says brother of James, so it's not that he's against his family, right? He's not, and he's not against Jesus, but he's saying, I'm a, I'm a brother to James, and I work alongside James, just as we're brothers in Christ, and we work, we're to work alongside of each other. But he says, I'm a servant to Jesus Christ. 
And a little interesting fact for you, Jude did not believe, Jude did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Jude did not believe that he was the Messiah. Jude did not believe who Jesus really was, that he was our Savior. He didn't believe that he was God with us until after the resurrection. And Jude says, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jude's writing to the people who are part of the church and consider themselves to be followers of Jesus Christ. He's writing to the part that which you all in here are telling me you're followers of Jesus Christ, okay? Um, uh, you, there, there's not a person in here who hasn't told me they believe in Jesus Christ. And, uh, excuse me, I think I just said follower. You all are believers in Jesus Christ. Because And you, you've told me that you believe in Jesus Christ. I haven't heard from everyone that they're a follower of Jesus Christ. But everyone's called to be Christian. But we can't be a Christian if we're not a follower. But they had a bunch of people in their church too. In that day, in the church, just as we have today, who, yep, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I'm a, I'm a Christian. But they were not followers of Jesus Christ. See, now the difference is that there, you, can, you can have believers and you can have followers. Um, and they're both part of the church. They both, um, they both will be involved with the church. There's people who don't follow Jesus. They say, I used to live it, okay? Raging alcoholic, living my life for me. But by golly, you know what? I was right there greeting at the door. There was a time when I was not following Jesus. I was on occasion. Interesting, I got a text, an encouragement text this morning from someone who said, you know what, uh, and he shared scripture with me and, and said um, uh, that, that if, we're, if we're not 100% in for Christ, we're 100% out. If we're only 99% in, and, and as, as he shared with me, he says, if I'm only 99% faithful with my wife this year, then I'm 100% unfaithful. And it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. And so they're, they're both there. We can believe, but are we following, right? And so there, there was a time when Joe and I were, we were, we were uh, um, part of the New Believers um, ministry. Um, so when someone gave their life to Christ, we walked with them, met with them, had coffee with them, talked with them, asked them, to, you know, answered their questions for them, whatever type of thing, gave them a Bible, all this stuff, and said, welcome to the family. I wasn't 100% in. I wasn't truly a follower of Jesus Christ. And I was living, honestly, at that time, I was living about 95% of my life for me. So there were followers can be a part of the church and they can even serve in the church. They, both, uh, both followers and believers will know Scripture. And most of, most of the time they can quote at least some Scripture. Both will likely pray. But the difference between a believer and a follower is, are they following Jesus Christ? There's the difference. We are not called to believe in Jesus Christ. Our Bible tells us that even the demons do that. If Satan's minions are doing that, does that make us anything? No. We're called to be followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus never told his disciples, hey, you know what? As long as you believe in me, that's all that matters. Go ahead and keep on fishing. It's fine. He said, come and follow me. He always invited people to come and follow him, not just believe. We have to start somewhere, so let's believe, right? But we need to get to following. And that's what Jude was calling out the church because there were some in, that, in, the, in the church of that day that were leading. They literally had snuck in and were leading uh, people away from Christ in that day. And he's saying, hey, come on, it's time for us to wake up. We need to get up and go and do what we're called to do. We weren't called to sit. We weren't called to allow people to stay where they're at. We were called to walk with them, help them to come, know, to, come to know Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he never left people where they were at. They might have walked away, and he let them walk. Rich young ruler comes to mind, right? He might have allowed them to do that. 
But he always, when the rich young ruler comes to him, he tells him exactly how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He invites him to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jude's saying to the church of that day, come on, it's time to get up. Let's go and do what we're called to do. Let's get up and get at it. And so he wants them to wake up, and he wants them to def- learn to contend for their faith, defend for their faith, in, in which, which we do how? By knowing what we believe and living like we believe it. That's how we contend for our faith. So he starts, he starts out, he says, um, um, he reveals his, 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 his motives, right? Um, offers, and then he offers this blessing also to, to his, his readers. Um, Jude 2 says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. So he says, hey, this is who I am. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a brother to James. Um, and, and, uh, and then he goes on to say this. He says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Mercy, peace, he's offering them blessing, when we're followers of Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love are ours. That mercy, that's that God's goodwill, you know, giving us what we don't deserve kind of thing. Um, uh, even though we're undeserving of it, he still blesses us. He has mercy upon us, right? And, and that, that peace, you know, that peace, it's more than just being the absence of trouble. Actually, the, the peace that he's talking about is the peace of Jesus Christ. And that peace of Jesus Christ is we have peace within the storm. Not that the storm's removed, but we have peace within that storm. We know we are Jesus. We know God's got us. We know, right? We have a calm and a peace within us. We know that we belong to Jesus Christ. And then that love, that, this is that agape love. Remember, there's multiple types of love. This is agape love, right? And it's talking about that love, that undeserved, that unconditional love that God has for us, right? Um, that God has for his church, for his followers, and, and that, that God's followers, Jesus' followers, are to have for each other, right? That agape, that unconditional love that we're supposed to give to others as well, even, oh, you know, our enemy, like when we've, pray for them and that sort of thing, right? Even that person who's trying to tear us down, they come to us in a time of trouble and we still try to walk with them in it. That agape love. So after encouraging them, he gets down to business and he reveals his intentions, in his original intentions in writing this letter and then he also reveals also a change that had come. In Jude 3 it says, Dear friends, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. That was his initial intent in this letter, was I'm going to write a letter to the church, and I'm going to tell, just let them know, and just help them to celebrate, help them to be eager and excited and jacked up about the salvation that we received through Jesus Christ. That was his original intent. And he goes on to say, I felt compelled to write to you, uh, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Some people make the mistake of believing this is all one thing, and that's what he intended from the get-go. No, it's, it's not. There, there's a reason. He said, I felt compelled. I felt compelled. He felt compelled by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. He felt compelled by Christ talking through the Holy Spirit, telling him, look, nope, nope. You're not just going to call them and tell you, don't, you need to not just talk about the salvation and the excitement of all that, but look here, we got some urging to do. Because we need to start contending for the faith because we're not doing it. Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Our faith in Jesus Christ. There's an urgency. Jude's, Jude's writing this letter saying, look, look, we have to get real about this. We need to start contending. We need to start defending. What happens if, if you have your home and you have your stuff and you have your whatever and uh, there's the argument, well, when did, when did someone's life become more valuable than your home or than your stuff? Well, when they decided it did, okay, right? We have that argument. We can go there all day. But just for not argument's sake but example's sake, okay, we have our home, we have our stuff. Someone comes in, I, I have my stuff, and Steve comes and he starts, he comes and gets some of my stuff and takes off of my stuff. And then pretty soon, then pretty soon we, we, we have Heather comes in and she starts taking my stuff and she goes off with my stuff. Pretty soon Steve comes in and he, he, he got, grabs some of my stuff, takes off of my stuff, and Kathy comes, takes, at what point do I start defending my stuff? 
It's mine. It's not theirs. What they're doing, stealing, which is another one of those commandments that we're not supposed to do, right? So when people argue with me, well, why would you defend your stuff? It's just stuff. It is just stuff. You're right, but it's my stuff. I did work for it. I did earn it. I did. God bless me with it. Whatever the, however you want to word it, but but the reality is, yeah. It, but but it's my stuff, and God says we're supposed to be good stewards of my stuff. Here's the thing: the church was not being a good steward of its stuff. There were those who were coming in and stealing from the church. Only they weren't stealing valuables. Well, what we like to call valuables, especially here in America, dollars and cents and that sort of thing. Instead, they were stealing souls. And he's saying, we got to contend for the faith. we got to contend for the faith. we got to defend. Contend, in the Greek word that, means, that, that they use here, means to enter into a, for all you who say I shouldn't defend my stuff, okay, means to enter into a battle and face danger while fighting with all of your strength. Contend. The contend that he uses, the Greek word is to, to enter into a battle and face danger while fighting with all your strength. He's urging the people of the church to fight with everything they got. Fight with all their strength. Not, not some of their strength. Not 99% of their strength. All of their strength. That's what he's urging them to do. He says, we got, we got, you got to fight. You got to fight for our faith. We have to fight for Christ. We have to fight for God. And the best way to fight is what? To know what we believe and to live like we believe it. That's what we're called to do. And it goes on to, to um, while, while he's calling the followers of Jesus to contend for the faith, he goes on into verse 4 and says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have sl- secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. There are ungodly people slipping in. There are people who are coming in, claiming a name, and they're coming in and they're poisoning the pond. There are people who, there, there, there are people who um, and we've seen it, we've seen it, there, there are pastors who've become pastors not because they wanted to share the faith in the, in, the, in, the, in the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but because they thought, if I'm a pastor here, I can make big bucks. We watch them over and over again. We see it over and over again. I want you to know I'm not one of them. Okay, so just, you know, okay. And I'm not saying all do, but some do. I, I had someone tell me that the reason they left ministry is because they couldn't make enough money at it. Good, I'm glad you left because you were never here to start with. They've got people who are coming in and they're stealing souls from God. That's what it is. It's ungodly people secretly slipping in. They're coming in. They put on the clothes. They got the right. They say the right words. They all love you, brother. But they were actually what they were doing was poisoning the church. And they were stealing people from the faith. And they're abusing. Another thing they're doing, they're abusing God's grace. Did you see what it says? It says here, um, who pervert the grace of our God into, into a license for immorality. What? They pervert. How do they pervert the grace? You know how they did it? Because they would sin. And here's the, and I've heard this and people tell me this before. Well, it just brings more glory to God. No, it don't. Yeah, it does, because here's the thing, right? So if I sin, God in his imminent, his unbelievable, never-ending grace will forgive me of my sin. And when God showers me with grace, I can tell everyone how God blessed me with his grace. And then that brings glory to God. So if I sin more, he'll spend more, share more grace, overflow me with more grace, and he'll get more glory, so I need to sin more. And that's what was going on in the church then. Guess what? Still happening. Still happening. We need to get up. It's time for us to get up. It's time for us to defend. We need to contend for the faith, as Jude said. 
Then he goes on. Okay, so he, oh, he talks about that these, these people, by the way, these people weren't just a, was like, oops, that just happened. How'd that happen? They were prophesied about long before it talks about. It says that they were, that they were told that they were uh, um, for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have slipped in. It was, long, it was prophesied long before this. Here's the thing, though. It wasn't just for the church of the first century. Okay, these people were for every age. And we see it every age. We see it every generation. We see people slipping into the church who are not there to build the body, not there to become a part of the body. They're there instead to steal part of the body away from God. That's what he's warning them about. Told you Jude has a little punch. So they come in with these false motives. Others come in with um, wanting what Jesus offers, but not wanting to be committed to Jesus. Not wanting to do what Jesus requires. Now, th- th- this was, of course, this was, you know, it's 2,000 years ago, right? So that got to do with us today. Because it's still happening today. We still see it today. There are some who come in and actually they want to grow in their faith. I want to get to know this Jesus. I don't know what this means. I don't know. I've never been in a church before. I've never never, never walked through the doors. I've been part of a body. None of that. I've never been there, right? And I'm just wanting to hear. I heard about this Jesus. Now I want to get to know this Jesus, right? And they come in and truly want to learn. They want to grow in their faith. And then there's the others who come in and say, guess what? We could take them away. I'll have them be my follower instead of Jesus' follower. And unfortunately, sometimes when they come in, they haven't even gotten strong enough. They haven't even gotten off the uh, breast milk yet. Uh, They haven't gotten even to oatmeal yet. And these people who were prophesied about long ago come in and steal them. And sadly, the church does nothing about it. The ones who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ should be mature in their relationship with him. They fail to contend for the faith and they fail to contend for the infant believer. And that's what he's talking about. Jude says their destruction was written about long ago. It was. You can read it in the book of Revelation as well. You can read it all over Scripture. It's in the Old Testament, New Testament alike. Their destruction, those who come to destroy what God has created, what God's called us to, those who come in and act like the devil and live like and choose like and follow the devil, even though we won't call it that because, well, that would just be like, oh, that would just be, I'm not that bad of a person. Their condemnation was prophesied long, long ago and is still to come. Maybe they're living a good life right now. Doesn't mean it's going to end that way. And this life isn't the good life. There's a life for eternity that's far different and far greater. And that's the one, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we should be living for. No matter what happens in this world. No matter what happens in this world. So there's some, some, that whole sin, grace, glory thing, there's some faulty logic behind that, right? Um, uh, they want to live their sinful lives. They just don't want to do what God's called them to do. They don't want to commit, truly commit to what God has offered them. And so, um, and, 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 and the this, this sin, grace, glory thing, Paul actually, years before Jude wrote his letter, Paul wrote a letter um, to the Church of Rome about the same exact issue. And uh, you might not realize it, but Romans was written years before Jude was written. Um, Romans 6, verse 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? You know, if I sin more, God has to give, he gives more grace because that's just who he is and then he gets the glory, that thing. By no means. 
By no means. There's an exclamation. Paul's worked up a little bit about this. He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have, we are those who have died to sin. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul's saying sinning so that grace can increase is a horrible idea. That's bunk. It's garbage. It's kind of like, should I hit myself in the head with a hammer so that the ibuprofen I took a little bit ago has a little more work. It could, it could, t- it could take credit for easing a little more pain. Should I do it? Maybe I hit myself again so then I could take some Tylenol. And it's the same logic. Do I keep pounding myself in the head so the pain medicine could do more work? Do I keep on sinning so God can shower me with more grace? Paul says if we love Jesus and if we've been baptized in him, We've shared his death and his resurrection, and we are a new creation in Christ. Jude's addressing the sin grace issue and, 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 and how it's an abor- uh, abuse and a distortion of, of grace. We're to live a holy life through the sacrifice, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as followers of Christ. And we're empowered to do so by the Holy Spirit that God sent. Jesus said, when I go, my Father will send a helper. He'll send the Holy Spirit. And he did. We all have the Holy Spirit in us. Problem is, do we listen to the Holy Spirit? Or do we write him off, ignore him, push him to the back? Do we ignore him? Do we turn a deaf ear to him? The other issue that's facing the church there is is that um, um, there were those who denied that Jesus was God at all. They didn't believe it. They they, they, they They were in the church and still did not believe that Jesus was God. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God sent here to be God with us, our Messiah, right? They did not believe that. Well, yeah, he was a pretty good dude. He did some stuff. Yeah, he he, he preached pretty good. He's good at it. He definitely was not God. He wasn't God's son. He wasn't God. So they believe part of what we now call the Bible, right? They believe part of Jesus' life, but they didn't believe all of Jesus' life. Guess what? There's still people doing that today. There's still people doing that very same thing today. And if we're going to be the body of Christ, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, if we're going to proclaim the name, we need to live the life. Because we defend our faith, how? How? knowing what we believe, and living like we believe it. So if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if we believe he went to the cross for you and for I, that he would come down born of a virgin, right? If we believe that, if we believe that his his resurrection gave us salvation, if we believe that all we have to do is give our lives to him and repent of our sins, and we will receive that salvation, if we believe that, then we cannot deny that he is God. And if he's God, then he's to be Lord. And if he's Lord, that means he's Lord of our life. That means he's in charge. When I started following Jesus, when I actually started following Jesus Christ, when I stopped being a name bearer, when I stopped being the hypocrite, and I became an actual follower of Jesus Christ, I became a new creation in Christ. 
why I've talked to so many people from my past, and they're like, I can't even believe this. You're totally different. Thank you. Praise God. Because it was he who did it. If you could talk to someone from 20 years ago, 30, if you've recently given your life to Christ, say five years ago, you, you said, I'm all in, Lord, and you've given your life to Christ. And if you go back, uh, you, you, you talk to someone who you haven't seen in, in 10, 15, 20 years, and they're like, man, you're just like totally different. You're like, praise God, because that's what I'm supposed to be. However, if you see them and everything's just like you left it, nothing's changed you never started following Jesus Christ. And if you're afraid or embarrassed or ashamed to let them know you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you never followed Jesus Christ. A follower of Jesus Christ will not be embarrassed of Jesus Christ. The church was allowing these people in, and they were not rebuking them. They were not walking with them. They were not helping them to grow. They were not, they were not calling out the life that they were living. They weren't doing what Christ would have done. And if we're Father <laughs> Jesus Christ, then we need to do what Christ would have done. And if we notice, Jesus didn't condemn people. Do you remember that? Like when he sat down like with Zacchaeus or Matthew or, or anyone that he sat down with, right? He, he, he didn't go in there and go, you're an idiot. You suck. You're just terrible. You're a sinner. Instead, he went in and offered them himself. He went in and he loved them. He went in and he met their needs. He went in to meet them where they were at, but not to leave them where they were at, instead to lead them out of where they were at. And he allowed them to make the choice as to what they wanted to do. And he allows us to do the same thing today. We have to remember Jesus is God. There is no doubt about it. Jesus is God. Not just some cool story that we've heard about. And if you, if you just think he's a cool story, well, that's great. Then please stop calling yourself a Christian. Because the reality is you're not. And I'm not saying that to kick you out of the family. I'm saying that that you would look at your life and say, oh, my living, what am I doing? Am I following Jesus? Or am I living for the world? That's what Jude's calling the church. He's saying, hey, look, y'all, you got some people in there. God even told us they were going to be there, and y'all are just letting them sit there. I actually was, was, was talked with someone um, this morning um, about that, that they'd been at a service, and not a single scripture was read in said service. Not a, not a single scripture read in the service. I would run from that building as fast as I could because the Holy Spirit's not alive in there. Jesus Christ is not being taught. How do you have a service, a church service, a body of believers coming together to learn and to grow in Christ Jesus and not have Jesus in the house? That's what he's calling them out for. That's what he's calling them out for. I love the way God shares them stories with me. And, and I didn't ask permission, but I used it anyway. Sorry. Um, but uh, um, I love the way God just puts it together. That 99% thing this morning, that text that I received this morning, that story I was shared with me this morning, that's exactly who Jude was calling out. God said, look, here's the word. I gave it to you already. Guess what? Uh, let me confirm it for you a little bit. Now, there's two ways. Some of you might be saying, I, I, don't, I don't deny Jesus. I don't deny Jesus. I never deny Jesus. But I would contend that most of us struggle in some way to some degree, or we have struggled by denying Jesus. And there's two ways that we deny Jesus. There's two ways that we can die, deny Jesus. The first one is by your mouth. Deny him by your mouth. Yeah, he was a good teacher. He was a good man. There's, it's a great story. It's cool. Yeah, that was good. Or, or it could be like Peter, you know. I tell you, I didn't know the man, right? So we can do it with our mouth. Number two, we can do it with your life. Do it with your life. 
That's the bigger issue for the church today because most people will speak it. They'll be like cool with it, especially if they're around the church, right? We're here. I can talk about God here. It's cool. Getting out there, I ain't talking about it. Mm. And that hole by the mouth thing, when we shut our mouth also, and you feel the Holy Spirit prompting you, and you keep your mouth shut, mm, 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 mm. don't let them call me Bible thumper. Keeping your mouth shut is also a way of denying with your mouth, by the way, just so you understand. We de- deny with our actions. We deny with our life. How do we live our life? I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. We're partying every night. We're getting all liquored up. We got wild women going on, wild stories going on, wild movies going on. We do, we're doing the party, party, party thing. We're, we're going to them concerts where they're talking about all kinds of nastiness. We're going, to, we're, we're, we're going to go to the comedy show where all they're doing is talking about all kinds of nastiness. What movies do we watch? All those things with all kinds of nastiness in them. And that nastiness can be all kinds of whatever you want it to be. How we live in our life. We can deny Jesus with our life. We can claim Jesus in here. We can claim Jesus when we chat. We'd be, be, be in the house chatting and having coffee at breakfast, right? We're talking about Jesus. But that night when we're getting all liquored up and drunk up and whatever, and we're telling them stories and we're taking God's name in vain all the time, our life is denying Jesus. It's just the reality of it. God doesn't want a percent of us. He doesn't even want 99% of us. He wants 100% of us. That's what he's called us to. We're to come and follow him. So do we openly profess Jesus? Do we openly profess? That's the part where we tell others. That's the part where we aren't afraid to have the Celebrate C in our car. We're not afraid to have, um, and I'm not into jewelry, but there's a thing with jewelry, right? Um, Jewelry can be an idol, and it can be a nice reminder, right? And so if we got our, our Christian cross on, right? That could be one of one or the other, right? And so it could tell people about your faith, but it can also tell people that even though I have this cross on, I'm going to live like the devil today. You can have your tattoos. I got one, right? You know, I you could you could have all that, right? But how are we living our life? How are we actually living our life? We're professing, but what is it that we're professing? If we live like Jesus, that means we're going to be a giving person. We're going to be a we're, we're going to be a loving person. We're going to be a, a forgiving person. We're going to be a a, a, a um, we're going to be willing to deny ourselves, right? If we're living for ourselves, I don't care what you need. I'm doing mine first. I get what I get. I'll give you some scraps at the end, maybe if there's something left over. We're going to be angry. We're going to be unsatisfied. Everything about me. We have a choice. How are we living our lives? How are we living it? It still exists today. And we need to get up. And we need to get going. And we need to defend the faith. We defend the faith how? Know what we believe and live like we believe it. Do we believe it? What's our actions? What's our life tell people that we believe? We got all this stuff, but I'm not about to give a penny to the church. We got all this stuff, but I'm certainly not buying that person who's down on their luck a meal. Got all my stuff. I care for my family, but I don't care about your family. That's living for the world. That's not living for Christ. It's not living for Christ. So if we need to know what we believe so we can live what we believe, then we kind of need to know what we believe, right? And so what do you believe? That's the question. As followers of Jesus Christ, first thing we need to believe to know and believe is the Holy Trinity. There's the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whatever you want to call him. I don't think I don't think God's holding strike cards against anyone up there. Um, there are some people who will fight you on that. Um, I personally don't think that God thinks it's that big a deal, you know. Um, but uh, what else do we believe? We believe God, uh, Jesus was God in human form. We believe that he was our Messiah. He, we believe that Jesus was a second person in the, in the Holy Trinity. We believe that. We believe that he was born of a virgin. We believe that he came and he walked on this earth. We believe that he sacrificed himself on the cross for us. We believe that we believe that he rose again three days later. We believe that he defeated the devil. We believe that he defeated death. We believe that. We also, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we know, we believe that we're supposed to follow Jesus Christ and thereby do what Jesus did. We also, as followers of Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus died on that cross for our sins, which means that if we confess and repent of our sins, and repent of our sins, he will forgive us of our sins. We know that if we, if we follow Jesus, we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we will be born new again in him. That's what we know we believe. We know that we believe all those things. We believe also that we'll have, if we, we, if we are a new creation in Jesus Christ, we'll have eternal life with Jesus Christ. We know that we believe as followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that the Holy Spirit indwells within us. That each and every one of us has the Holy Spirit in us. Even as non-followers, we have the Holy Spirit within us because we believe that God sent the Holy Spirit to all people after Jesus. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't follow Jesus Christ and not believe that. I can't be a follower of Jesus Christ and go, Alan, you just don't have, the Holy Spirit's just not in you, man. You're going to have to pray the Holy Spirit come into you. He's already in there. You might need to start listening to him. You might have to ask him to open your eyes on some things. You might have to ask him to strengthen you in some things. He's already there. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we believe that the Holy Spirit's indwelling within us. And because of the Holy Spirit indwelling within us, and because of Jesus' sacrifice, we know that we can live a blameless life, a a, a grace-filled life. doesn't mean we never sin. It means that our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did. That's what we believe. As a follower of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will talk to us always. He talks to us each and every day. The Holy Spirit is in here. He's talking to us each and every day, each and every second of every day. That's when I catch myself and I go back and I think I just said, right? That's the Holy Spirit going, hey, get back here and correct that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why? Because I'm not perfect. I mess up once in a while. I use the wrong word. And then I'm like, eee. And he says, no, 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 no. Go back and correct that. Now, I can tell him now, blow off. I don't need to. But I'm not going to. But I can't say I never have. Holy Spirit's in there. He's trying to lead us. He's trying to get us to live out our faith. Each and every one of us. Question is, will we? So what do you believe? What do you believe? If we'll listen to the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to walk that blameless life. Blameless life doesn't mean no sin. It means that God knows that we're living every minute of our life for him. He knows also that we're a sinful creation. He knows that we're going to blow it. But he also knows that his Holy Spirit is telling us, leading us, guiding us, trying to get us to do the right thing, and he knows if we're listening to him or not. He knows if we're sincere in our asking for forgiveness. He knows if we're actually repenting or we're just running words. Because, well, they said, all I got to do is say, I'm sorry. Another one of the lies the church says. Oh, you just got to say you're sorry. That's all you got to do. Just ask for forgiveness. Just ask for No, you got to repent. So now what? The best way for us to defend our faith is to know what we believe and live like we believe it. And when we live like we believe it, the world will see it and they will, they might reject it, but they also might receive it. And living like Christ is a much bigger testimony than running your mouth. Because people say, yeah, he said that, but then he did that. So what do we believe? 
how are we going to live? Will we live out what we believe? So my question for you today is, what do you believe? Father God, This one gets close to the corn, Lord. We might have took out a stalk or two. Father God, I ask you in this time, in this place, Father God, I ask you to help us, strengthen us, grow us, dear Lord, that we will, we will live the life that you've called us to live, that we will, man, that, we, that we'll, we'll actually want to jump into your word. We want to learn and grow, what, learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ learn we want to we want to man we want to experience being a follower of Jesus Christ that we would we would hunger we would long for that dear Lord and that we would sit down to the table and enjoy that meal that we would ingest and digest your word dear Lord that we'd be in prayer with you we'd be that we would listen to your Holy Spirit that we would we would do the things that you ask, ask of us to do that we would we would we would interact with the world that we're in as Jesus did. And, and, and if he was, he was standing here physically in front of us and we saw him doing so, we would do the exact same thing. We'd be like the little kid who's mirroring their dad in all their actions, whether they sit in front of the TV and they bring up the hand and the whatever, Lord, um, that we would, we would do that, that we would be not just an imitation of, but we would live the life, uh, life like Christ did. Not that we would just look like it, but we'd actually live it. Not that we'd just claim it, but that we'd live it, Father God. That we'd not deny you with our lips nor our lives. Father God, I ask that you just be with each and every one of us today. And in and, and, and those places where it's like, man, he just, he just took out a stock of corn right there, man. He just took out a stock. He got a little too close on that one. Father God, I ask you to help us. To understand that there was, I did not take out a stock of corn that was meant to be there. I never took anything out. It was your word, your message that I received from you. Father God, I ask that that, that stock of corn, that we would understand it was smut filled. We'd understand it, it was, it was poisoned. Father God, I ask that you help us, help us today to begin living that life to the next level, living that life, going the next mile as Jesus would have lived it, that we would follow him in the most amazing ways, dear Lord. I just ask that you just have your way with us. I ask you to overwhelm us. Holy Spirit, I ask you in this moment I ask you in this moment for each person who's asking of you right now, I ask that you would overwhelm them. I ask that they would know, they would experience you in a way they've never experienced you before. And I would ask this congregation right now to ask the Holy Spirit, come into me, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're here. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. I've been throwing you out, but I'm not anymore. Spirit, just lead me. Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, speak to me in a way that I can hear and acknowledge and understand and know. Holy Spirit, me that I can grasp what it is you're saying. Holy Spirit, when you nudge me, let me know in some way that it's you doing the nudging. Family, I would just ask that, man, just we today, in this moment, in this time, if you've been living for yourself, you stop living for yourself. If you've been speaking for yourself, you stop speaking for yourself. As Jude desired to root to encourage the church to root out those who'd been prophesied about, Father God, I ask that you would help us to root out. And sometimes that that person who was pros- prophesied is within us. And that doesn't mean that we should leave and never come back. It means that we need to root that person out from within us. And so, Father God, I ask that uh, you hear the prayer, the prayer of this congregation. Congregation, I would ask you in your hearts just to pray, Father God, 
is to ask you to, to, to renew me, to refresh me. I ask, I, I ask that you would, just, you would just overflow me right now with your Holy Spirit in a new way. I ask that you would root out, remove that wickedness, the evil, the ugly, that you'd remove that from my spirit right now because I no longer want to live according to this world. I want to live according to you, Father God. Father God, just remove that from me. Don't allow it to stay anymore. Don't leave any little scrap of it, of the cancer of sin, the cancer of this world within me. Instead, Father God, I ask in this moment you'd Scrape that away, cut it away, remove it. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would wash me, cleanse me, wash that void, and fill it with Jesus Christ. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this prayer. I thank you for the prayer that each person who just prayed that prayer, I thank you for the new beginning, a person starting today. I thank you for that, Father God. And Lord, I just lift up each and every person and I just say, Lord, here they are at the foot of your throne. Have with them, have your way with them. Do with them as you will. Help us to grow in your love, your mercy, your ways, dear Lord. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.